Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, what I hope to be for you guys an uh, informative session here. Um, my name is Scott Ashley, and I'm the president and co-founder of Get Ready. We're uh, an organizational resilience company, which, uh, you know, basically we, we're, we all come from a medical or an emergency background, uh, police, fire, military, EMS, um, and we've been in the emergency management space for many, many years. Uh, we've, uh, I'm myself, I'm a former uh, flight paramedic on, uh, on the air ambulance on uh, Bandage One out of Toronto, which is called Orange. And, um, you know, we've been really over the years seeing what people were always struggling with and what do they do during an emergency? How do they recover their business and business continuity issues and EOC? Back in about 2006, we started to, to develop a program called Infectious Disease Outbreak uh, Programs, and we started building them for hospitals, and along came SARS, and there was some work in that, and getting some things sorted out and helping, and we didn't do a lot of corporate work at that time, but we did a lot of work with the ministry and stuff. And then uh, the H5N1 came along, and we got into that. And we developed a lot of different programs for companies at that time. And that was back in the day when people were buying Tamiflu and it ended up really not being a big thing. Um, since that time, we've developed a, a bunch of infection control programs for hospitals and other groups, uh, private sector companies, pharmaceuticals, vaccine manufacturers, and so on. And um, obviously back in uh, Christmas, you know, December, people were watching what was happening in China and in the new year. And early February, we thought, you know what, we're going to have to take our program and and pivot and, and change it around a little bit. And the goal was normally these these kinds of uh, plans and, and pandemic planning programs and stuff like that, they take a lot of time. They take a lot of work. There's a lot of committees. And, um, and we just don't have the luxury of that. We need to roll stuff out to people quickly and easily. And so we really just developed a cloud-based tool, a return to work where people could access all the information they need and so on. So what I'm gonna do though, is I wanna talk a little bit about the goals here, um, you know, of, of building return to work. The governments and people have been watching this on the news and it's always the top 20 or 200 stories every day, you know, for the last three months about uh, COVID-19 and what are we gonna do? And people are waiting and waiting and the, there seems to be a lot of uncertainty. This is this is the world's biggest uh, medical disaster, you know, um, that we've that we've ever faced. And so it's uh, it's very confusing for people. That's causing a lot of concern. And and quite frankly, a lot of people are just not sure on the direction that they should take. But at the end of the day, the goal is is to protect employers, their employees, and their customers or, or visitors or the public, depending on, on what, uh, you know, what the operation is. We have to provide consistent messaging and procedures to give staff, the citizens, visitors confidence. A big part of this is going to be the psychology. And if people are confident, they're going to come to work. They're going to come to your store. They're going to come to, you know, your, your place of work or, you know, um, buy things or visit, um, you know, and they need to have the confidence. If they don't have the confidence, uh, they're not going to come. And um, this needs to be rapidly uh, deployable. And, you know, we believe in having some degree of certification so that you can demonstrate to the Ministry of Labor and, and other groups, insurance providers and so on, that you've actually built a program that uh, that stands up to to examination. So, what I want to do is take a couple of minutes and talk about infection prevention and control, or what we call IPAC. Now, in the healthcare business, in, in EMS, in emergency services, we've been using infection control principles and programs, you know, forever. Um, every hospital has a has an IPAC manager or specialist. Every EMS service, uh, fire departments. We all have this type of training. We all have these programs in place, and um, the private sector has never had these programs in place. And, and this is really all we're talking about. So what is infection prevention control? Um, 
I'm just going to fix the screen here a little bit so I can see a little bit easier. But at the end of the day, on, on the screen you'll see in front of you, these are all the elements that make up infection prevention and control. So, um, you know, the disease characteristics, what are the signs and symptoms? Um, how is it transmitted? What's the incubation period? What are the treatment protocols? How do we get tested for it? You know, how do we report to public health? Is there a vaccine coming? If there is, how, how fast, how much is going to be available? You know, basic skills like hand hygiene and so on, um, self-isolation. You know, we've heard of all these things. So in a hospital, someone is, is there to decide what kind of hand cleaning we need to do for the staff and for visitors and for patients, what kind of masks or gowns or goggles. If you're going into the OR, what kind of PPE are the medical staff wearing? If you're going into the ICU, if you're going into a labor and delivery, if you're visiting someone who has the measles or meningitis and they're in isolation, um, a couple of years back, we had a couple uh, Ebola patients in Ontario here. And, and, and what do you need to put on to protect yourself, to protect the patient? All of this is what has to be put into now the private sector and all non-medical government agencies. And that's really the bottom line. This is, is a complete sort of um, activation of a whole new system for businesses, for schools, for, for restaurants, for whatever. Everything you've done in your normal business can carry on. You just now need to add elements like this so that we can protect it and continue on in a safe way. And this is very achievable. Hospitals do it every day, paramedics do it every day, and we think about these things and we understand it, and it's part of our life, and uh, it's really, this is the change. This is the new normal that people are afraid of. And because of the medical element, most organizations that we talk to, they don't want to sign off on it. They don't feel comfortable. They don't have the infectious disease background. And so it becomes really, you know, what do we do next? And what's the government going to say? And are we going to open? Are we not going to open? Are they going to give us the package? Well, you know what? They're going to tell you you need to have a program, but they're not going to build your specific program. And that's what we help you do, but ultimately that's what you're going to have to do. And hopefully this, in, you know, what I'm going to talk about now gives you some information. So that's what infection control is all about. The private sector's never had it, and now everybody, every workplace needs it. So. You know, first of all, you want to start off with a safe assessment. You want to look at risk. What are the uh, minor, major, and critical findings? So what are legislated requirements that your workplace would have to have? What are the major findings? These are often the guidelines from the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, CDC, WHO, but here in Ontario, you know, the Ontario uh, uh, Public Health. Um, they all have recommendations. For example, you've heard these things. You know, you should wash your hands. You should have social distancing or physical distancing of at least six feet. Um, you should not be walking towards one another. You should have flows. And, you know, what do we do if we find somebody and assess? And so may, minor findings are things like signage. And, you know, if you don't have the right sign or you don't have any sign, you know, that's a minor finding. Ultimately, you should have signage. And some signs are more important. But the critical findings are the legislated pieces and then the guidelines and then down to the minor. Um, we try to put these together so people can get clear recommendations uh, of what they need to do and how they need to do it. So let's start with screening. And there's self-screening that people can do from home before they even leave their house in the morning. Geez, I'm not feeling well. I'm not coming in. You know, that's, uh, you know, personal and self-screening. But screening at work, at, at stores, at grocery stores, you know, everyone's been out in the last, you know, few months. And, you know, if you think back, uh, you know, 10, 12 weeks ago, there was a rush on toilet paper. And I think everybody thought that was it. There's no more toilet paper. And, you know, things come around and they go around. But, but the screening, you know, they ask you questions. Have you been in, in contact with somebody? Have you been in an area of, a, of an own outbreak? Well, that's what we used to say. Well, now everywhere's had an outbreak, so we don't take, ask that question anymore. Um, maybe some places are taking temperatures. But the reality is over 50% of the people are asymptomatic. And asymptomatic simply means the person does not exhibit any signs or symptoms. They do not have a cough. They do not have a sore throat. They don't have a fever or chills or headaches. They don't have, you know, a high temperature if you're using a thermometer to measure things. They're, they're, they're fine. They look fine. The problem is, is they're carrying the virus. Um, 
So how do you screen those people? Well, years ago in healthcare, after uh, HIV came out and a number of other diseases, everyone started practicing what was called universal precautions. And that was the switch back in the, in sort of the, um, mid to late 90s, that everybody started wearing gloves. Nurses didn't wear gloves and doctors didn't wear gloves and paramedics when they were starting an IV or doing certain skills. Now everybody puts on gloves. And, you know, this is really what we look at in terms of how do we screen, what do we need to do, and how do we keep ourselves safe? So what I'd like to do is give you some information on understanding risk and personal safety. And these are exercises that every hospital goes through. This is what the paramedics do. Um, they'll identify the hazard. What's the vulnerabilities of that hazard? And what's the exposure to that? You know, here in the middle, we have a little illustration of the coronavirus, uh, little crowns. That's why it's called corona. Um, but, you know, we look at what is the hazard, what's our vulnerability, and what's our exposure. So the way to reduce our risk is basically this simple triangle. And I'll just take a couple of minutes to go through it with you. Distance is the first and the easiest. So stay away. Stay away from each other. And, you know, we've seen it in, you know, in stores. We've seen it in, in, uh, out in the public. We've seen it walking the dog. You know, people are staying back. They're letting you pass. They're, they're keeping apart. And they're keeping that at least six feet distance. Some people say, why is it six feet or why is it two meters? And there's a slight difference, but roughly it's, a, it's about that space. Well, the reality is when someone coughs or sneezes, they can actually send out droplets or airborne up to two meters or up to six feet. And that's why we want to stay away from those people and keep that distance. So the first way to do this is distance. Now it's funny, we're seeing on TV and I'm sure when you, know, when you guys are out and about, you see people wearing masks. Um, the easy answer, but not the best answer necessarily, but the easy answer is to go to PPE and start putting on masks. And people say, now that's better. Well, that's actually your last choice. And in all healthcare, in all emergency services, in the military, PPE is the last choice. Um, if we cannot distance ourselves safely, if we cannot um, have time. And so on the right-hand side, you'll see I've got the blue and the yellow and, and the red. So, for example, if you had a, at a restaurant or a business and it was a little tight in terms of space, well, you might not be able to have all the staff there, even an office building where you've got a lot of people in one, in one office area. You may not be able to, to, you know, going forward, have the same number of people in, in that space. So what you do is you shift it. And so maybe, you know, food prep in a restaurant, people are coming in and they're gone by noon and maybe the cooks come in from noon to five or something like that. And maybe the dishwashers come in, you know, at the end of the day, and then people can actually work safely in that environment instead of having all those staff in at the same time. Um, certainly in offices and we're working with lots of different companies and, and that's one of the things they're thinking about. You know, some people will stay home on Mondays, others on Tuesdays, others on Wednesdays to create a little bit more distance and space because of different time shifts. If distance and time are, are an issue and that can't be resolved, then we look to engineered barriers. Um, and these are organized, planned. They're not just you know, sticking up a piece of plexiglass, but it's actually a risk assessed use of plexiglass or barriers um, to prevent that. And if all of those three things can't happen or can't happen adequately or safely, then PPE becomes the solution. So um, PPE brings its own uh, sort of <laughs> issues uh, in terms of training and use and misunderstanding. And, you know, we're seeing lots of people now wearing cloth. Um, masks and they're and they're putting it on maybe their favorite hockey team or things like that or some you know funky design um they're not medical grade masks they're not safe masks and and you know the uh, coronavirus can pass through those so you know they most people aren't even trained how to put on a mask properly or take it off. And so there's a lot of issues around, around PPE and it's important that people get the right information and the right training and understand exactly what they're trying to do. 
once you've decided that, then you have to go and you have to start look at social distancing or physical distancing. This broke down to the notion of social distancing started off back in in you know February, March kind of thing, early, early March. And the notion was we called it social distancing so people wouldn't shake hands, they wouldn't fist pump, you know, and stuff like that and hug. We want people to be socially distant. So the, the gestures that we normally have done most of our lives, we wanted people to stop. Most people, they get it. They don't shake hands anymore. They've stopped doing those kinds of things. And, and now the term is really around physical distancing and making sure that people have, um, you know, uh, safe distance from one another. So this is an example of a floor plan that we did down the uh, Niagara Falls Ryerson Innovation Hub. It's just a quick example of how we move chairs and desks around, how we created signage, what they're gonna do for coffee stations and, and kitchens. This is just a sample of a quick floor plan of a small business and how the checkout process could go so that staff can be safe. And all of these things can be run without masks. Uh, gloves are, are virtually unnecessary unless it's a first aid emergency, because if you don't wash your hands and you decide you're gonna put gloves on, then you have to wash your gloves, otherwise you're gonna to touch your face with your gloves. So, but looking at social distancing, the workflows and procedures, that's an important piece, the signage. Um, one of the things we really try and do is look at mac maximum occupancy in a space. We don't want to go into one store and see 20 people lined up inside and you go to the next store, same size, there's only four people in there, right? We want to make sure that, uh, that the people running the stores and running these office environments understand how many people can be there. And then everyone else gets it and they know the rules. Hand sanitizing, signs, uh, stickers, things like that are important. Ultimately, you want to have access to your new playbook. How does your new infection prevention and control program work at your office? Um, we have uh, desktop programs, uh, cloud-based on the phone or, or uh, mobile or on the computer, but we also provide sort of playbooks. We've seen a lot of companies develop these things. This is something that your business, your operation is going to have to look at and create. Um, the government is probably not going to come out with a very detailed program. A lot of people are waiting for that. You know, if you think back to everything else under occupational health and safety or under fire codes, they'll tell you, you need a fire plan, period. They're not gonna build your fire plan or give you every single detail that you need. So these become important pieces as you're thinking about your plan. Um, you need to train your staff. This is a whole new world. Most people have no idea what infection prevention control measures are. They don't understand social distancing. They don't understand the use of PPE. They don't understand what to do if there's an exposure in the workplace. Um, you need to get them up to speed. They need to feel confident in what's going on. So the training becomes really an important piece of this. You need real-time tools or, or at least ways that you can track what's going on. Who's coming to work today? Who's not coming to work today? Why are they sick? Is it, is it uh, COVID related? Are they sick because they were quarantined? Because they were traveling? Because they're taking a test and waiting for results? You know, do they have the signs and symptoms that they may be sick? So you need to be organizing what's going on with this stuff. If you have an exposed person, we were talking to a customer yesterday, um, they do deliveries and they just learned uh, yesterday that one of their drivers tested positive. We, yesterday was the first time we ever talked to these people. They don't have a plan. They didn't know what they were gonna do. Who do we call? How do we organize this? How do we track who's, you know, where this driver had been? Was he in the warehouse? Was he, you know, um, with the loading? Did he talk to people and get uh, some of the bills uh, from the finance department? In terms of customers, where did he go? What was his route? Family? All of these things become big issues. This is one of the biggest concerns that the, uh, that the government has these days as we start to open things up. What happens if we have a little, uh, you know, exposures and we suddenly it becomes a cluster outbreak in a community? We need to stop these things quick and you need to have a way to think about your exposed person and, and how to track them and work with public health. 
Um, this is a, this is, we're just showing this to people because it's a useful tool. We created this app. It has 75 one minute videos, how to do CPR and bleeding and give EpiPens and use things like Narcan and what to do for mass casualties. But we've also put in it, how to hand sanitize properly, how to put on and take off. It's called donning and doffing of masks, gloves, how to self assess, how to self isolate. If you have to stay home, at your home with your family? How do you do that? How do you share laundry? How do you, you know, where do you sleep? All these kinds of questions are things that people have. So we want to make sure that people have access to this kind of information. Ultimately, you want to be able to uh, track that your organization is compliant. And, and this is a big deal and people are just trying to sort it all out. Um, but you need to record that every day related to COVID and related to uh, infection prevention control, you have screening processes in place, you have social distancing in place, you have hand sanitizer available. You have a reporting mechanism and a team overseeing this. For those of you that have joint occupational health and safety committees or OCH health and safety groups, um, these will become new additions to your, to your daily, weekly, monthly checks that these committees go through in a workplace. So um, being able to track what's happened is, is a very, very big deal. The um, the COVID-19 is now a reportable illness uh, by WSIB. And so they will be sending inspectors out to see if there's a claim. And so we need to stay on top of this and be able to show evidence that we had the proper plans and processes in place. So that's really at the end of the day, what people are looking for. At, you're gonna need for your program, you will need proper screening, at home, at work, the screening procedures, um, workplace social distancing, the signage, the flow of your of your people. If you're in a assembly line, how do how close do people get together? The various workers. How do you work with with other equipment and shipping and so on? The courier or shipping when the courier uh, driver arrives, where do they put the package? Who touches it? Who doesn't touch it? You know, do they come right into the building? Do they leave it in a certain spot? You have to sort that out. Hand sanitizers and stations. Um, this is really important. We make sure that we have all of those placed with all of our clients at key access and entry points so that it's easy and it's not a burden for people to find a way. At your, at your coffee stations, you know, at your uh, photocopier and printing stations, those kinds of things. You need to look at your food and coffee procedures. We did some work with uh, one of the universities recently, and uh, we ended up um, recommending they, they close their, their refrigerators and their, and their microwaves and stuff like that. And everyone was sort of shocked and it was like, well, think about it for a minute. You know, and suddenly everyone's like, yeah, that's a good idea. I think I'll bring a thermos if I want some soup. Exactly. So you have to have these procedures. You have to think through them. Illness tracking is very important. Exposed worker, very, very important. You get on it right away. You deep clean the area that they were involved. You track the people that they were in contact with, excuse me, who they were in contact with. And, uh, and you report it to public health and you work with them to try to, you know, stop this thing before it takes off. Um, having proof of compliance is really, is really important. And, you know, time is of the essence. So, you know, let's get back to work. We can do it safely. Let's take all the confusion and uncertainty out of this. This is simply an IPAC problem. This is an infection prevention control. You just need certain procedures, practices, and, and, and policies, and you need to train your people and get them to say this is the way we do things around here now. So what I wanted to do is, is I'm gonna stop there. And if anyone has any questions, um, more than happy to uh, take a look at these. So just to give me a second here. Um, I think we have a couple in the chat. Do we, it says, how do we budget in a time of emergency? Do we prioritize growth or keeping the lights on more so? Are we uh, at greater uh, cybersecurity risk now because of holdbacks on, in funding? Um, well, I think um, there's a couple things here. 
this 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 question isn't entirely to the to the subject we're talking about, but um, cybersecurity is is for sure at a risk. People are are disor disoriented right now. They're not paying attention. They're logging in more and more from home. This is a burden for all the IT departments. Uh, we see this kind of stuff. So um, for sure, the cybersecurity is an issue. And from from everything that we've been hearing, you know, it's it's definitely on the on the rise and. Um, so, you know, with people logging in and trying to use emails and setting up new passwords and getting access remotely and stuff, um, it certainly creates a more vulnerable situation. So you need to make sure that you have that button down and working with your IT department. Um, in terms of uh, budgeting, um, in a time of emergency, you know, um, this you know, first of all, to plan for an infectious disease program in your workplace should not be a massively expensive undertaking. Um, most places you can spend a fortune on PPE. We had a client the other day, they've, they spent almost $40,000 uh, on masks and sanitizer and stuff like that. And, and that's fine and that'll, that'll work for, for their particular needs. But ultimately, a lot of places, staff shouldn't have to be wearing a mask. Um, they should need hand sanitizer, uh, but they won't need masks, they won't need gloves, they won't need gowns, they don't need to wear goggles. Um, you know, again, part of your risk assessment will will you know, determine those needs, and then you you plan accordingly. So um, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. I think um, you got to get people back to work. You got to demonstrate safety, and so by putting in some basic fundamental procedures, you can you can go a long way with those. Um, so risk assessment is important, but how are we going to uh, communicate the impact in order to achieve 99% uh, compliance with IPAC? Right. So the risk assessment is important. Um, what needs to be done is to train the staff as to the exact procedures that your organization has put together. And so this is the messaging that has to come in when people phone in sick. This is how they will expect to arrive at work. Here's the distances that will be pre-set up ahead of time, the signage. Um, we did some work with one big retail group and um, it was really just a series of, of choreographed um, you know, actions. So if I was a reception person and you were coming towards me as the, as the shopper and you had your merchandise, you would stop there, I would explain the rules, you're gonna come up, you're gonna place your items here, and as the person approaches, I'm gonna move back, I'm gonna move out of the way. So I'm socially distant. So the person comes up, they set down their merchandise, I've removed myself, I'm six, eight feet back. Now that person returns back to their original space, I come forward as the cashier, I ring through the merchandise, I bag the merchandise, and then it's ready to go. I step back now, the person can come forward and pay, interact, whatever. And once that transaction's done, then um, they, take their, uh, they take their merchandise they paid for, and they wash their hands, and they leave. I now move forward, use hand sanitizer, disinfect my area, and the same thing, the next person comes up. And that's a process back and forth and back and forth in give and take. And it allows you to become very safe and very compliant. And you know what? When we, when we rolled this out, we had staff who were like visibly very upset and very afraid and very concerned. And now they're, they're absolutely, you know, they're happy. They're, they're not afraid to go to work. They know the drill. They know the routine. And they're getting all the staff are telling the, the customers the same messaging. This is how we do it now. And, and you know, quite frankly, you know, I, I've mentioned this before to people, you know, the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the people you're dealing with, they want to know it's safe. They want to know you have a good process. They feel confident and comfortable being in your, in your workplace. So, you know, you'll get a lot of support and buy-in from people. Some people are in a hurry. Some people don't think about stuff. But even that seems to be changing a bit. So, um, Will social distancing impact of will social dis impact COVID nineteen uh, translate through into normal daily life when we return back to work? Um, will people uh, be hesitant to to shake hands with their peers? Yeah, of course they're going to be hesitant. They're not going to want to sit beside you. They're not going to want to shake your hands. So when the government says you know and and you know, you can now return to work. 
you know, you're still going to find our opinion is for sure that virtually everybody is not going to want to shake hands. Uh, this will go on for a long time. We still have a second wave of this coming. And historically, with all pandemics, and this is a major global pandemic for sure, um, it, there will be a third wave. So, you know, you're going to see this kind of lifestyle, this kind of uh, socialization uh, for, for well into to next year, I would imagine. Um, even if a vaccine is, is, is produced, tested, and then run out, they actually have to produce a lot of vaccine, billions of vaccines. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge process. It's not going to be here quick. Um, will people be yeah, asked that? Um, will offices uh, be forced to enforce sanitary uh, workstations, common rooms? Absolutely. You know, one of the things that was a little shocking, I think, to almost everybody in the room, we went into to an office uh, corporate environment and we went into one of their uh, boardrooms and it was a very nice room, lots of, you know, nice furniture and paintings and all these things. And that, that table's done. That's not going to happen for for a long time. Um, there's no way we can have all these people sitting beside each other or across the table that wasn't wide enough to be uh, safe. And so, you know, we started looking at obviously the rest of the sort of the meeting rooms, the training rooms. You might have a meeting room with four, six, or eight eight table or eight chairs at it. That's not going to happen. Um, so, listen, I'm just going to keep blasting through here to make sure that. Uh, um, What will the essential factors that uh, places like colleges and universities will need to implement in order to eventually reopen? So, you know, I think you're going to find with colleges and universities, uh, the it will be the labs, it will be the placements that will be happening. A lot of the lecture will most likely break down to online learning for now um, to demonstrate social distancing in any kind of a you know theater or you know auditorium lecture hall type scenario is is virtually impossible. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of online a lot of, uh, you know, training and certification. And hopefully, you know, we can get people out into their electives, we can get them out into their placements and, and give them the experience they need. And that'll be up to the, uh, the companies or hospitals or whatever, you know, as they're working through with, uh, you know, maybe they're going to teacher's college or whatever, and they're going to be seeing what the school board's doing at that time. So um, that's a really, really tough one. Um, and I'm just going to look on your Q&A here. Um, so, yeah, we see social distancing becoming a norm for a long time, for sure. I think that's, that's for sure. And it's amazing when you see on TV sometimes, you know, people are sick and tired of it. They're sick and tired. They want to get out. They want to, you know, summer's here. And uh, you've probably all seen pictures in the news of people at the beach or people, you know, uh, getting together. And it's like... You know, you just have to slow down on that. And, you know, what we don't want to see is a spike again in the number of, uh, of, of uh, exposures. So we just have to be very cautious and, and take this as a new norm for a while. Ultimately, this will end. And ultimately, we'll be able to shake hands and do things. But for the, but for the meantime, we have to be uh, safe and get ourselves back on, on in the work, get people back on the job, making money, but doing it safely. Um, visiting medical facilities for routine checkups or minor health issues. You know, hospitals have this nailed. They're very organized. They're very safe. Um, the flip side of this is regarding visiting hospitals or medical centers during, during the outbreak. You know, what we've actually seen is how many people um, died or had problems because they waited too long, like cardiac or stroke patients. They should have gone to the hospital. They were afraid because of COVID, and then they waited too long, and the outcomes were not positive. So our healthcare system is, is very switched on. They have all the appropriate PPE. Um, they have good spacing and physical distancing. So, you know, I think, you know, hospitals are actually one of the safer places to be. So if you're, if you're not feeling well or you're sick, Follow the advice of your doctor or your emergency or your ho local hospital. Um, I think you'll be in good hands. Will people be given an option to work from home if they are worried for their health, or is it a company or is it company dependent? Um, so, 
this is where sort of the compliance comes down and is your program, you know, do you meet the legislative requirements? If people have the right to refuse work here in Canada, and if they think that the workplace is unsafe, they can refuse that work. However, the Ministry of Labor will come in and inspect, and if they deem that it's not safe, then fine, you can stay home or you can refuse that work. If they deem that that's safe, then you, then you as an employee have a choice. You either want to continue with that job or you don't. Um, so again, if, if, if employers and staff and unions can work together to make a safe workplace, there's really no need for people to stay at home if, if, if all the pieces are in place and people understand what's going on. So it is in everyone's best interest to work together to make sure that people can get back to work. Um, I think a lot of companies will probably have people working from home more than they did. And I think that'll be probably a good thing and maybe a little easier on the highways and on the, the 400 series highways and so on. I think that'll maybe reduce some of the, uh, you know, the usual commuter uh, problems we've had uh, for however many years now, you know, as long as I can remember. Um, but yeah, I think these are things that we're going to have to, you know, get our arms around and, and see what happens and, and test it. But um, it, this is not that difficult. It can be achieved. It can be achieved fairly quickly. You know, um, literally, we, we, we try and look at a turnaround time of less than a week uh, to come in, do the assessment, get it set up, have the recommendations. Some of the things might take a little bit longer if there's, if there's barriers and plexiglass and stuff required. But generally speaking, you can build a plan uh, you know, quite quickly. So anyways, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I think we're probably just over our timeline here. I don't think there's any more questions. Is there one more there? What has been your recommendation for businesses involved in childcare? Yeah. Um, that, that is the hardest one. Not only do you have the, the staff and the ministry and all the guidelines that are there, the problem is you also have this group of people called parents. And um, I have children. I get it. Um, parents can be, you know, tough and they're afraid and they're, you know, nobody wants to put their child in harm's way. And so I think it's very important that when you build a program, you bring the parents in first, you explain the process, explain what's going to happen. Obviously, if you know you, there may be limits to the number of people, we may look at shifts. You know, maybe some people will have daycare, you know, earlier and and leave a little sooner. Others might come longer, or sorry, later in the day and stay longer. You know, um, we're certainly not going to be at the point where we're we're putting you know twenty uh, three year olds and four year olds in the same in the same room anymore, um, or as many. Um, you know, like in Denmark, a lot of the stuff they do outside, they have that extra uh, social distancing and stuff. So it is going to be new, new ideas are being talked about and looked at. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenge, but I think you need to make sure that you bring in all your stakeholders, parents, the, uh, the associations, the, uh, the staff, you know, and really be able to think. We do a lot of support with people like that, thinking through the issues and what are the alternatives. And you know, it was funny. Even the other day, I'll give you a quick example. We were in a we were in a hair salon, and we were doing a walk through this community. And uh, the question was, well, we understand that we can't blow dry people's hair anymore. And as you can see, that's not an issue that I have. But um, you know, people can't. Uh, they can't. They can't. They were told they couldn't use a blow dryer. Well, they can use a blow dryer if they're in their own space. So they looked at creating, uh, changing one of the rooms in the back, and that's the blow dryer room. And so people can get their hair cut. Everyone's wearing PPE. They've got curtains up and and protective, so they have you know sort of that engineer barrier or that distance between the chairs. When someone it's time for them to, uh, they don't want to come out from the hair salon with their hair all dripping and being wet, so they can go into that space they can put on a gown and the mask and they go in there and uh it just it just 
the whole place was thrilled that they uh, that they were going to be able to do that. And so, you know, it's 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 just thinking sometimes a little bit outside the box how you can do these things. What's going to work? What's not going to work? But you have to understand how diseases transmit and they transfer from person to person. And then if you if you understand that, you can very quickly make a plan that'll prevent that from happening. So, yeah. Is there any other questions? Well, if there's uh, if there's any other questions, let me know. Otherwise, that's uh, I think that's really it. Oh, hang on here. Do we have? Uh... Yeah. So. Uh, and just, uh, this is our first time with the CyberX Exchange, so um, I'm just being reminded here, if you have more questions, um, network it or send me, send me a message or, or come to our booth and, and uh, ask some questions, feel free. We're happy to help you. And I know this is a concern, I know it's a problem and uh, it's a manageable problem. So let us, let us help you if, 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 that's, uh, if that works. So um, yeah, I think that's it. So. Thanks, everyone.